Ukraine's capital, Kiev, has come under renewed attack as Russia ramps up its invasion now in its second day. Air raid sirens have sounded in Kiev this morning and blasts were heard in the hours before dawn. An apartment building was partially destroyed after Ukrainian forces said they downed a Russian fighter jet over the capital. Sirens have also been heard in the city of Lviv in western Ukraine. The Ukrainian government says at least 137 people have been killed and hundreds wounded across the country. Russia is continuing its air, sea and land assault, which it launched in the early hours of Thursday morning. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says the fate of Europe is being decided in his country. Ukrainian soldiers on the outskirts of the eastern city of Kharkiv, inspecting just some of the carnage from day one of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Then, after dusk, the destruction continued. In Kharkiv, civilians took refuge in subway stations, looking for whatever safety they could find. Also in the Ukraine capital, Kyiv, people headed for the underground, fearful Russia could launch airstrikes. I'm here because I think it's one of the only places right now where you can hide in Kyiv. All the other places are terrifying. At a strategic airbase just 20 kilometers away from the capital, reports of Russian forces in control. However, Ukraine says it prevented a complete takeover of the facility. Ukrainian troops have set up roadblocks throughout the city's government quarter. Late on Thursday night, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said he was aware of the danger, but that he was remaining in the capital. According to our information, the enemy has listed me as target number one and my family as target number two. They want to destroy the country politically, terminating the head of state. Satellite images also show the destruction Russia is raining down on Ukraine. Here, the damage to airfields in the east of the country. And Russia is proving it's not only interested in military facilities. Ukrainian officials confirmed they've lost control of the decommissioned Chernobyl nuclear power plant. The scene of the world's worst nuclear disaster is now in Russian hands. DW correspondent Matthias Berlinger joins me from Kiev. Matthias, city residents have been spending the night in air raid shelters. There are reports of explosions in the capital. What is the situation there right now? Yeah, people are coming slowly out of these shelters now. But as you can see, there are few people on the streets. Many people have left the capital. We've seen these pictures of uh, long columns of, of cars leaving the city. Um, the, the, there was intense uh, bombing last night. American intelligence says that Russia fired 160 rockets on Ukraine and uh, part of them on the capital. There was also uh, 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 air defense uh, destroying some of them. We are not sure now, right now what exactly happened, but there were, there were clashes in the air when air defense hit something and the debris fell down and hit one residential building. Uh, people had been evacuated from there, but the building was burning and we don't really know about casualties yet. Um, so uh, the whole night there were there, there were there, there were attacks on the capital, and uh, today there is the expectation that uh, Russia will try to move with tanks onto the capital again. Can you give me an idea of the mood among Ukrainians? Uh, the family members I've spoken to are staying. Uh, many have been fleeing, and others want to fight. Well, it's terror. People are afraid of what's going to happen next uh, and they're trying to do their best to, to protect themselves if they don't enlist in the uh, forces. We've also seen 
uh, pictures of people queuing up in front of the recruitment bureaus of the Territorial Defence Forces, that's the volunteer uh, battalions uh, that are supposed to act behind the lines uh, in support of uh, the um, uh, army and uh, we uh, know that they have been mobilised also. There are numerous reports that suggest Russia could enter the capital, even in the coming hours. They've already taken control, as we mentioned, of the Chernobyl area, around 150 kilometres to the north. Will they be met with resistance? The Ukrainian ex uh, government expects them to come from two sides, northwest and northeast. Um, and has announced fierce resistance. What we've seen so far is that the Ukrainian army has been uh, countering this attack quite forcefully. Uh, they are much... Uh, the, the Russian army is, of course, in terms of technology numbers and everything, much superior to the Ukrainian, but the motivation to defend the country is there, and uh, we've seen these battles around the airfield that we've uh, heard mentioned before, uh, where Russia was able to almost take control of it and then it has been, it seems to have been, according to our information that we have now, have been completely driven out again. So um, there is, uh, of course, a desire to, to defend the country and uh, these uh, weapons that R Ukraine has received, the javelins uh, and the stingers, of course, they will be put to use. Matthias, what about the situation in the east, which has been so key to the fighting over the past eight years. Uh, describe what you saw on, on your journey after returning from the east to the capital. Well, we left pretty early in the, the we left the east pretty early, so we didn't witness any of the fighting there. There were uh, a bomb uh, yesterday morning. There were rocket uh, artillery attacks, um, but we didn't see them. What we know now is that fighting has intensified along the line of contact with these self-proclaimed republics, and uh, also the city of Kharkov, which is not part of the Donbas, that part of the east that that Ukraine has and, and the separatists backed by Russia have been fighting about for years but one uh, another region closer to Russia this has been also been under attack so uh, and, uh, attacks on Ukraine are happening from all sides and from the south as well so um, we have reports of, of heavy fighting everywhere. Matthias Bodinger in Kiev thank you very much and stay safe. Well, we can go now to our Russian affairs analyst, Konstantin Egert. He's on the line from Vilnius. The world is looking on in, in disbelief at these events in Ukraine. What's your assessment of Russia's standing in the world, considering what's going on? Not such a good morning, uh, Ben, and I hope your relatives in Ukraine are safe. Uh, I think that, uh, in fact, these pictures... Uh, with, that we've seen in the last 24 hours, uh, are a PR disaster for the Kremlin. Uh, I don't think that even during the, uh, the Yugoslav War of 1990, we've seen anything like that. A major European city of nearly 3 million, and well, across a major European country, 44 million population, the largest, uh, largest European country uh, wholly uh, situated in Europe. So I suppose also there is a very clear, um, well, PR implication and all that, if I may sound cynical, uh, and that is that uh, Ukraine wasn't taken in one blow. We don't see, uh, you know, flowers and flags that uh, basically it seems like uh, the Kremlin expected to see. Uh, the resistance is stiff. Matthias has noted uh, in the previous report uh, from, from Kiev that uh, this is... Uh, of course, a, a very unequal competition uh, between the Ukrainian and Russian army. But on the other hand, defenders always have an advantage uh, and motivation, of course, is quite high uh, among the Ukrainian forces. I cannot even imagine what will happen uh, if and when the Russian forces enter major Ukrainian cities. We've seen what happened in, the, in, in Chechnya, in Grozny, uh, in, in the North Caucasus in Russia in the 1990s. We've seen that Aleppo held out in Syria for about a year against an air force uh, onslaught. Uh, I wonder what will happen in Kiev. Again, I think it is already a PR disaster for Moscow.
And, and if they do manage to enter Kiev, um, how quickly could the government there fall? Well, uh, it seems that uh, the fall of the government is not on the cards. Because I do think that in such circumstances, I cannot penetrate the thinking of the Ukrainian government. But I would be quite surprised if they didn't make uh, any kind of arrangements for the government to continue to operate from other parts of Ukraine, probably from Western Ukraine. And actually, what I think is a possibility is that the uh, Russian forces could strike at Western Ukraine. It seems uh, quite um, unimaginable now, it's also because it, is, it, it borders NATO, it borders Poland. Uh, and also because uh, th there's a fierce kind of anti-Moscow feeling there. But uh, I suppose that, uh, that uh, the Ukrainian government thought about it. I do not think that taking Kiev as such, uh, or Kiev as uh, the Ukrainians will call it, uh, will mean the collapse of the Ukrainian state. I do think that there was a provision made for that. And everything we've seen in the last 24 hours show that the structures of the state are still there. Well, apart from invading, I mean, the Russians would need to occupy some of the country for some time to keep any sort of puppet government in, in place, if, if that's what the intention is. I mean, we, we saw that with Yanukovych, of course. He was driven out by the Ukrainians. Well, look, uh, I think I'm, my, 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 my military service is limited to three years and I'm a first, first, first lieutenant reserve, but, so I can't pretend to be a military expert. But uh, frankly speaking, I think that uh, occupation force for uh, a, a country of such size and such population uh, needs to be really huge. Uh, Russian army, I think, standing Russian army, is about one million people. Probably you will need most of it to take over Ukraine and maintain a permanent occupation. Well, like Putin said, he doesn't intend to occupy Ukraine, but then what's the point? I suppose that keeping uh, the puppet government, well, you can keep it in probably in one place. You can probably control Kiev, uh, but it will be very difficult to imagine how this government will, uh, will project its authority across the country where I'm certain there's going to be a guerrilla war. Uh, so I think it's uh, nearly mission impossible. Uh, that said, how are Russians viewing this invasion? Well, I think that what I've seen last uh, night and all through the last day uh, surprised me. I thought there's going to be much fewer protesters in uh, Russia against the war. What I've seen actually in my native city of Moscow uh, uh, is quite impressive. OK, it's a, hundred, a country of 140 million people, so, um, I mean... It's not probably such a huge size, but one has to understand, people fear, people are apathetic in Russia. So those who went to the streets are very, very brave people. And I think uh, the current figure is about 1,600 arrests. But what's looking into the future, what I can say, this war cannot be popular. And each day that it continues will sap support for this adventure. Uh, whether it will eventually turn into some kind of elite uh, pulling out between themselves or mass demonstrations, I don't know, but it will probably take time. But I'm sure it's not, it's not popular. And as we heard from Konstantin there, there have been protests both in Russia and in Ukraine. Konstantin Ega, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you. Well, European Union leaders have agreed to impose new sanctions on Russia over its war on Ukraine. But they held back from cutting Russia from the global SWIFT payment system after resistance from some countries. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen says the agreed measures would have a major impact on Russia's economy. We will hold the Kremlin accountable. The package of massive and targeted sanctions European leaders approved tonight clearly demonstrates that. It will have maximum impact on the Russian economy and the political elite. And it is built of five pillars. The first is the financial sector. Second, the energy sector. The third is the transport sector. Fourth are export controls and the ban of export financing. And finally, visa policy. Christine Mokunbra is in Brussels for us to talk about the sanctions. Another round, how far do they go, though, this time? 
Ben, the European Council President Charles Michel said that these sanctions were massive and painful, and by all indications, they will be, Ben. They will be felt by ordinary Russians as prices go up because of inflation, ordinary household items uh, going up in prices. Um, we can also expect, uh, Ben, that some businesses will not survive uh, as the economy goes into recession because of these sanctions. Beyond the sort of medium-term impact, uh, this is also going to effectively destroy industry, some industry industries in Russia as, as they're not able to access uh, certain technologies that are required to power a modern day future. So it is certainly looking like these sanctions will have an impact uh, in the medium term, but also in the longer term, Ben. Christine, we've had a, a whole raft of sanctions now, a whole series of them, uh, from weak to strong and now massive, but the harshest of them all would be cutting Russia off from the interbanking system called SWIFT. But we're hearing that Germany and Italy held off on that. Why? That's right. Ben, you've got to understand that for all the sanctions that are going to be imposed on the Russian economy, uh, they're also going to hit European economies too, and some more than others. For Berlin and Rome, perhaps there is self-interest uh, at play here. For, for, for Germany, it is, of course, uh, those, uh, the, that dependence on Russian gas. Germany is a major Russian gas importer. Um, for Italy, it's those increasing business ties uh, between it Italy and Russia. The SWIFT payment system is a messaging system between banks, uh, been and cutting Russia off of that would effectively make it impossible to send money uh, to Russia and out of Russia. And of course, that makes doing business with Russia difficult. Germany and Italy have been accused of pursuing self-interest uh, at a time where, you, you know, lives are at risk. In fact, the, the Ukrainian um, uh, foreign minister, uh, hours before that meeting, anticipating that this would happen, said that anybody who wouldn't um, uh, dis uh, vote to, to ban Russia from sort of effectively had the blood of Ukrainians uh, on their hands. But there is also another argument to this, Ben, and that is um, that you've got to keep some leverage um, because if this goes into some kind of a protracted war, you've got to be able to have some leverage to go to Moscow and, and put something on the table for. So that as well is, is a factor that uh, European leaders uh, did consider. I understand the argument on, on leverage. Um, I, I don't want to talk more about the, the business reasons behind this, but, but, I mean, why hold back when Russia really isn't? I mean, that's the strategy of Putin's to uh, go in um, and, and um, not hold back. I mean, watching Europe holding back here is, is, is really unsettling, I, I have to say. Uh, but before I go on a rant, let me uh, just play to you something the Ukrainian president said. Listen into this. In all the many conversations I've had with other leaders today, I've heard several things. The first one is that we're supported. And I'm grateful to every nation that helps Ukraine in concrete ways. But there is a second thing. We are alone in defending our nation. Who is ready to fight with us? I don't see anybody. Who is ready to give Ukraine a guarantee of joining NATO? Everyone is afraid. A very good question. Let me pose that one to you, Christine. Is Ukraine alone in this fight against Russia? We have to say, yes, uh, Ben, that is the reality. Um, when the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg briefed the press yesterday, he confirmed that there were no combat troops, uh, NATO combat troops in Ukraine, and that there were no plans to send any to Ukraine. Um, so this is certainly uh, a fight the Ukrainians are, are going to have to take on on their own. We know that NATO is making plans. Um, it has warships and battleships on high alert. It's given special powers to its top commander. He can effectively uh, deploy NATO's response force uh, without having to go through the procedure of consulting all the 30 allies. But this, these provisions, Ben, have only been made for NATO member states and not for Ukraine. For Ukraine, it is the promise of more political support, uh, more military aid going over to Ukraine. And indeed, we have seen some initiation uh, by some member states uh, opting to send more military aid as well as financial donations to help the Ukrainian army. But 
Ukrainian soldiers will not be fighting alongside Western soldiers in this fight. This will be their, their own fight, uh, Ben. Christine Melbourne, why for us? Our Brussels correspondent, great to have you on the show as well. U.S. President Joe Biden has also moved to punish Russia with fresh sanctions, saying he's convinced Putin wants to overthrow Ukraine's democratically elected government in a premeditated attack. Biden has ruled out military intervention in Ukraine, but he did affirm the U.S. commitment to defending its NATO allies in Eastern Europe. And Putin's aggression against Ukraine will end up costing Russia dearly economically and strategically. We will make sure of that. Putin will be a pariah on the international stage. Any nation that countenances Russia's naked aggression against Ukraine will be stained by association. When the history of this era is written, Putin's choice to make a totally unjustifiable war on Ukraine will have left Russia weaker and the rest of the world stronger. Liberty, democracy, human dignity, these are the forces far more powerful than fear and oppression. They cannot be extinguished by tyrants like Putin and his armies. They cannot be erased by people, from people's hearts and hopes by any amount of violence and intimidation. They endure. And let's bring in our correspondent in Washington, Stephen Simons. Stephen, we heard President Biden talk about Russia having to pay dearly for its aggression against Ukraine. For President Zelensky, the sanctions are not going far enough. And as we heard, Germany and Italy have their business interests to think about. Could the US have done more? Well, I think uh, you heard a president actually who was trying to exert leadership here and who was uh, kind of also desperate to uh, uh, keep the House of the West together. Uh, unity is a key word here, you know. Um, uh, if you leverage sanctions against uh, Russia now, uh, you need to do this unified. And as soon as this unity uh, shows cracks, um, you'll have a problem. And I think uh, the U.S. administration, U.S. diplomats, as well as I think uh, European governments uh, realize that. So the president tried to exert leadership here. Um, speaking of the sanctions and the SWIFT program, you know, uh, it's fairly easy for Russia to get around the SWIFT program. So the president actually alluded to this because uh, the Americans say they had actually told all of the allies and partners uh, that and also told and foreseen what will happen, that Russia will go for a big grab on Ukraine, not just the Donbass region. Now, I don't know if that's true, but that's at least what they claim. So, but... Um, could have been done more to save Ukraine? I don't know. Probably not. There's a lot of experts out there, a lot of people a lot smarter than I am who say and who have good reasons, good arguments for saying like this was un uh, inevitable and uh, they couldn't have done anything more. Sanctions leveraged now against Russia, uh, they are not preventing anything anymore. They are punishment and, um, and they are leveraged for future possible negotiations, I think. Okay, yeah, Stefan, we're just looking at live pictures of Ukraine and the situation right now, which is a very sad situation, uh, a bombed out building there. The, the US has ruled out military intervention in Ukraine, but what more can it offer in order to support the country? Yeah, troops on the ground uh, or boots on the ground, definitely not, uh, because Ukraine is not a NATO member. And of course, the United States wants to avoid, and that is expressed this verb is also um, uh, the president saying, as well as everybody else in his administration, that uh, the U.S. does not want a war or a confrontation soldier against soldier with the Russians. Um, the belief is here also that the Russians don't want that either and actually uh, are um, a little bit afraid of that's going to happen. So, but you have uh, a horrible situation in Ukraine and uh, there is really no clue offered by anybody what the U.S. can do actually to actively help uh, the Ukraine now. Uh, definitely not militarily. Um, more uh, weapons, to get more weapons or weaponry or weapon systems into the Ukraine right now uh, seems a little bit iffy at best. I mean, um, if not even impossible. Um, so uh, moral support and uh, maybe an increase in or a, a uh, leveraging of more severe sanctions 
peu à peu, step by step, in the next mm -hmm. coming days. But but, uh, but the uh, US afraid, is sending uh, over uh, more troops here... to neighboring NATO members. We know that. How how is the American public feeling about that? Yeah, um, we know that the Americans sent 7,000 troops to Germany, uh, and from there they will be sent uh, to uh, other uh, nations to the eastern border of NATO, so to speak. Um, I can't tell you how Americans feel uh, about this because uh, it's a little bit too early. That was yesterday that the president uh, said that. Um, I know, though, that the American public now pays uh, attention to what's going on in the Ukraine, but that's not necessarily because the United States says they're sending 7,000 troops. That's because the president said that uh, every American will feel the pain, and that means at the gas station. The sticker shock is coming to America, and of course, Mr. Biden realizes that this is not um, something which helps him politically and in the eyes of the American people. Stephen Simons, thank you very much for the analysis from Washington.